I'm Melissa Lampy. I'm the Society President. A um, couple of upcoming events on Saturday, November 30th, Sunday, December 1st is our annual Christmas play at the Octagon House. This year's production is A Wizard of Oz Christmas, so we hope you will attend. And then also, um, at the end of December, the 27th, 28th, and 29th, uh, the Society is hosting a special Christmas and New Year's reading at the Octagon House Museum, uh, which will be a very special event. And so there will be more information coming out about that in the Daily Times in the coming weeks. So, Our presentation tonight is on vintage Christmas collectibles. And we are very fortunate to have Mr. Fred Waldberger from Stoughton here with us this evening. And I've known Fred for a number of years. I used to live in Stoughton. And he is an expert in all things vintage Christmas. And he's brought, as you can see, a number of items to share with us. Uh, my name is Fred Waldberger. And I have an antique business, remember, when in Stoughton. And we sell on the internet. And I have a website, buyoldchildrensbooks.com. And we sell a lot of children's books. Uh, I started collecting Christmas about 25 years ago. Started at an auction with a $5 box of Christmas ornaments. And uh, I went through some things today that I have displayed in my house and uh, didn't actually get into the stash of stuff. So this is some of what's normally out all of the time. And I'm going to send some pictures around of our and most of it is our Christmas room. We have a big uh, Queen Anne home, and inside of it, in the front parlor, seven Christmas trees sit up year-round, uh, along with many of other things. Actually, with a feather tree, there's more than seven. So I'll send the pictures around, and you can take a look. I'd like to get them back. Uh, but you can take a look at them, just kind of pass them around as we do the presentation. Uh, the other thing that I brought along is I brought along uh, three of Bob Brenner's books uh, and I'll let you page to them a little bit as we uh, do the presentation again uh, when we're all done somebody can bring them back to me and uh, he is actually relatively close I can't even think of the name of the town where the flea market is on Saturdays uh, over by Pewaukee or someplace there, uh, not Pewaukee, uh, Partyville, Princeton. Princeton is what I'm thinking of. So these are his three books that he wrote, uh, very informative. Uh, and I think probably the book that will be of a lot of interest will be this one here from 40s to 1959. Uh, because that is the type of things that you will see the most and would actually have a chance to see out for sale or if you were collecting uh, would be more relevant uh, to some of the things you might see. Mm -hmm. What I've done is I've kind of a titled this presentation uh, Collecting Christmas is More Than Christmas Ornaments. And most of the time when people think of collecting Christmas ornament or Christmas, the first thing they think of is ornaments. And yes, ornaments is a big part of collecting Christmas, but it's not the only part. And there's some really other nice areas if you get into collecting Christmas that might be easier to find materials and find nice things and you know, there's other things out there. So what I'm gonna do quickly is go through a list of things or different ideas for collecting Christmas. And as I do, I'm gonna try to go from table to table here and pick up and just kind of hold up and kind of show. And then when we're done, if you'd like to come up and take a look, uh, some things I can pass around, uh, some things I can't. But if afterwards you'd like to come and take a look, we will stay a little longer and answer some questions and let you take a close up look at some of the things that are here. Uh, the first thing is old vintage Christmas photos. Now, and I'm not talking about snapshots, I'm talking this kind of stuff, early Christmas scenes. Uh, and the, these are around, you can't find them, but they're getting harder and harder to find. And you know, the cabinet card type Christmas scenes with the children, the toys, the Christmas tree, the inside of the house. Even some of the 40s and 50s snapshots now of Christmas scenes with the Christmas trees, it's always fun to take a magnifying glass and look and see what they've got in the Christmas trees and see how they decorated and what things they were using. Uh, I'll 
I'm just going to leave these sit here. Like I said, I'm going to kind of try to hit a lot of high points here. Uh, postcards. Now this book I'll pass around. Postcards. I have, a, I have a weakness for postcards. I have a binder. I took a few of each. I've got a binder that thick with just Christmas postcards. And that's not the ones that I've sold in between. So what I'll do is I'll pass these around. There's a number I've got in front here. Uh, these are squeaky cards. I don't know if anybody's ever seen squeakies, but if you press them, they squeak. And that's why they're in front, so there's no weight on them. Uh, here's some Santas, different Santas. Again, I tried picking a few, like I said, there's a big binder. Uh, some pages of Santas in other than red. Uh, some of the blue, green, some of the other colors. Here's a green Santa. Uh, some of the old time Father Christmas, Kris Kringle uh, type Santas. These here are pictures. These are hand tinted European uh, pictures from Germany and Switzerland. Uh, Christmas uh, scenes, trees, and these are all hand tinted, hand colored. <coughs> None of this is reproduction stuff that you'll see on these tables at all. So here's this, uh, you know, some other Christmas. Here is a set of Christmases. You got to remember, postcards normally were put together in sets, and so this is one set. This is a Wench uh, collection of, uh, of one of his sets. These are some point uh, point set of postcards are real common, uh, and a very good collectible in postcards now. Then there's some other U.S. ones that are hand tinted. Uh, then also here another big collecting field is actually Christmas cards. And uh, I put a few Christmas cards in here, uh, older Christmas cards. And again, you know, these are turn of the century, uh, probably before 1900, or I mean before 1920, before the First World War. So I will pass you, this is a celluloid uh, Christmas card here. Uh, so I'll pass this around and you can take a look at this. I'll just start, uh, maybe I'll start right here, huh? Since we're going on this side. Oh, we've well, got some daddies here, too. Uh, okay, Christmas cards we talked about, like I say, and even some of the 50s, 40s and 50s post uh, Christmas cards, especially the Christmas cards that are patriotic, with the red, white, and blue that were sent overseas to the soldiers during the Second World War. I have a bunch of them. Unfortunately, they're really in my trunk room, and I don't know where, but they're there someplace. And uh, hard to get a hold of them. That just seems like everybody wants them, and real hard to find those uh, Christmas cards with the red, white, and blue. Uh, the other thing that, and I didn't bring any along, uh, trade cards. Uh, you're talking here about the trade cards that the merchants used to give uh, for you bought a product. There was an advertising type thing. The Christmas trade card ones are real popular also. The Santa Claus is in the holly and the snowman. Uh, that I didn't bring any of those along. Uh, in the bunch of pictures, there is a uh, picture of our, well, I guess I'd have to say the living room. And all across one whole wall is calendar tops. And these are pressed cardboard. Some people call it egg, egg carton. Uh, but they're calendar tops. Uh, from, well, you hopefully you get the ones before the first, second, before the Second World War, and they're very colorful uh, and portray Christmas. And if you see that picture, you will see what I'm talking about. Very, uh, very nice to have. Again, getting very, very hard to find uh, the old uh, calendar tops. Another collecting field would be actually magazines from the 30s, 40s. Uh, with the Christmas illustrations in them. Uh, back covers, you know, Santa Claus hawking lucky cigarettes. Uh, all kinds of things like that that uh, have good advertising in them is still very collectible. Take the magazine, you know, if it's especially, I, I don't take them apart. Uh, I, I have a phobia for that unless they're really so bad you can't do anything else with them. I do sell vintage magazines also. But if you have bad ones, you can take them apart, get them boarded, get them framed, some excellent, excellent advertising, and you can still buy this stuff relatively inexpensive, uh, some, especially some of the great illustrators that did magazine covers and things. Sheet music, it's another whole field. 
sheet music uh, with the illustrations, you know, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, uh, 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 Snowman, uh, all of the artists that did the fo colorful uh, Christmas sheet music. It's a whole other collecting feel that very few people are actually into doing that now. You can still find some of this stuff out there. And again, you're talking generally sheet music, the stuff you want, ideal if you can find is before the First World War, that's the bigger sheet music. And then between, you know, between the wars, that sheet music there in between and before the First World War. Matchbooks, uh, whole collecting field in matchbooks, 1940s and before 1930s matchbooks with advertising on them for Christmas. Uh, again, there's some, in one of the, the books uh, there shows a whole collection of uh, the types of different matchbooks. They were advertising for different companies, had Santa Clauses on them, all kinds of uh, novelty uh, Christmas illustrations on these matchbooks. Again, if you're going to look for matchbooks, uh, the ones with the front strike, those are the older ones. The back strike is going to be newer stuff. I think they passed a law about 1970 that they had to have a back strike on them. So you're looking for a front strike, matchbook covers uh, with a Christmas uh, theme. Uh, another area, and I did bring some of this stuff, is just Christmas boxes. Now these are empty boxes, but very collectible item. They're very attractive. You know, Santa Claus, uh, it's an empty box, but a very nice decoration to have for just putting out and decorating with. Uh, here's another one, you know, different different uh, boxes. Uh, then you go into the other types of advertising. Here's a, a Christmas cigar box. <coughs> beautiful. Just in, if, after a while, we can open it up and take a look. But it's absolutely beautiful inside. Here's another Christmas cigar box. And uh, so this stuff is really the tins, the early 19, you know, 1940s tins, 30s and 40s Christmas tins. Christmas tins here. Uh, children's books, and like I say, I'm kind of a, it's really hard for me to sell old Christmas children's books. I, I don't sell a whole lot of them, I keep most of them. But, you know, the night before Christmas, big favorite, big collecting field, the night before Christmas old children's books. Even some of the newer stuff. You know, if you're collecting the board books, and I didn't bring any board books along, usually uh, if I do sell Christmas books, they're board books, you know, the little, uh, little golden books, the wonder books, uh, the telltale books, those types of Christmas books, very collectible, especially if you got first or second editions, uh, you know, from the 50s, the gold <laughs> bindings, uh, very collectible. I keep the older ones. Uh, here's another night before Christmas. This is a book here, The Bird's Christmas Carol. Uh, <coughs> probably, uh, I've heard of it, uh, Kate Douglas Wiggins. Great old Christmas uh, book. And this one here is The Christmas Stove, and you've probably heard that, seen that book, or have read it at one time or another. Uh, it was actually, this one was, uh, it takes place in Switzerland. These here are some 1800s Christmas books from the 1800s. St. Jolly, St. Nicholas, and these two I actually had out, so I was able to bring them, like, like I said, a lot of the stuff is packed. I mean, it's hard to have it all out. Then we have the, the big illustrated ones here, you know, the Santa Claus, Rudolph, Night before, uh, no, where is the night before Christmas? Here's the night before Christmas. <coughs> Very collectible items. And this is an activity book. Now this one's a little bit newer. But again, as we're getting to the point now where even the stuff in the 70s is got a place now. And uh, you, know, you, you wouldn't think so, but it does now. Because we're all getting older. Uh, candy containers. Uh, you know, the Sunday school candy boxes that you used to get at school with the string on the top and you get a little box for Sunday school. Very collectible items. Now I brought a couple, uh, I remember where I put them. Yeah. 
down. Uh, Christmas boot, paper mache Christmas boot. Now I've got some that are much bigger than this. This one again I had out so it's easy to get a hold of. But it was stuffed with candy. And that's what it was. <laughs> and then these here are uh, West German uh, Christmas balls. And they were stuffed with candy and hung on the tree. And so these are, I've got some bigger <coughs> ones at home. I have about display, I got about a half a dozen of them displayed. These two fit in the box. The other ones were too big. Uh, hard plastic. Uh, the 50s, 50s and early into, into the 60s, the hard plastic, uh, even late 40s, you know, the, the reindeers, the, the Santa Claus, a lot of Santa Clauses, the, the uh, lollipop sucker holders, uh, all of that hard red plastic materials, you know, versus the celluloid stuff, uh, angels, there was just all kinds of things. And again, uh, some bigger pieces, Santa Clauses, riding a reindeer, one comes to mind, it's about this tall. Uh, these things you can still find, they're still out there. There's still some, they're not horribly expensive. Uh, some of it can be, but uh, some of it is something you can purchase and, and you, you could find if you're looking for it. Uh, stockings, uh, you know, hanging up your stocking. Big collecting field, the felt stockings, the net stockings, uh, and the paper stockings. The felt ones, where they had the diagrams and the, the decorations and things on them, a very big collecting field and hard to find. You just, and if you find them, they're, they're, they're very expensive if somebody's selling them uh, because they were all thrown out. You know, especially if you find the stockings that still got everything in them with the header and everything. I mean, if they're the net ones, big, big thing to find. That's a real, that's a, that's a treasure. Uh, metal tins I talked about. Okay, here's one that's going to, and I got the book here. I hope. Don't see it. Anyway. Should be here. Christmas seals. Uh, another big area, and I have a book. And we, I do collect Christmas seals. They're in a cigar box. <laughs> uh, a cigar box, and they're pasted on the back of postcards, and so they're kind of scattered. They're, you know, I don't have a central location, but I have a book. And it's got all of the post, all of the uh, uh, Christmas seals since the beginning, from the first ones all the way down, all illustrated. And I was bringing that so you could see that. And I don't know if I left it or what I did. I might have left it. Anyway, so Christmas seals is another area that you very definitely could be uh, looking at and. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a collectible that not everybody's looking for that you can get in on the ground floor, so to say. Uh, okay, what else have I got here? Candles. You know, the decorative candles that, that Gurley put out and all of the, the snowmen and the Santa Clauses and the boots and the houses and the angels and, I mean, there's a whole, and, and those are available. Uh, you can't find them. You can buy a lot of them for less than ten dollars you know and so they are out there you want to find the ones that are girly and hopefully they have the label yet on the bottom and they haven't been burned a lot of them weren't burned they just had them out for decorations so they so they were not burned uh, packaged goods uh, Christmas snow the boxes of the decorations that people had the tinsel boxes the real lead tinsel boxes you know, these are like from the uh, late 40s, you know, you know, the real tinsel, uh, corsage boxes with the, cors with the corsages still in it. The lights, this is a Paramount uh, cross light. Uh, so any of this type of thing that, it doesn't have to be full, but you want a, a box or, you know, a good display item. 
You know, this one here was candy box. You know, so there's a lot of that type of thing. Uh, let's see, nativity scenes. And I didn't bring a nativity scene. Um, we have a big wood one up year round. Uh, but those figures are very popular, uh, especially the older ones, the wood ones, the hand carved ones, those types of things. Then you come into the, uh, the plaster. <laughs> Uh, the plaster ones, there's, there's some carved out of stone. Uh, and like I said, I mentioned wooden plaster. Uh, bo uh, bottle brush trees, now these are old bottle brush trees, these not new bottle brush trees. The decorated ones, this is a musical one here. Uh, real hard to find the old decorated bottle brush trees now. Now here's a couple, and again, the bigger ones, the bigger the better in bottle brush trees. Uh, this is a nice pair here. These are smaller, <coughs> but kind of matches that one there. Um, bottle brush trees, and again, I should mention this, you know, there's a lot of reproductions of bottle brush trees out there. And there's also wreaths. There's bottle brush wreaths uh, that are also decorated. Now you can, you know, go with the wreaths, but again, there's reproductions of both of them. The cardboard houses, uh, here, these, most of them were Japan. There was some out of Germany, but most of them were Japan. Uh, and they were used in putz scenes or just to decorate. Some of them had a hole in them to put over a light so they would be lit. Uh, they'd actually hang them on the tree. Some actually had a bulb built right into them that you'd turn into your... Uh, into your socket. Uh, some of them are very ornate, very large, uh, very detailed. Uh, again, these I had underneath a Christmas tree, so I took them. Uh, celluloid. Celluloid uh, first started about 1870, and I brought some celluloid items, and celluloid died out. It didn't completely die out, I guess, because they still make guitar picks out of it. But generally, celluloid is gone. And again, here's a celluloid Santa. Here's a Santa Claus in a car. Uh, there's a celluloid here, uh, skiing. Celluloid died out because it's very flammable. And uh, so when they got other items, it's actually the first plastic, first you know, manufactured plastic, first artificial, you know, real plastic, but it was very flammable, and so being around Christmas trees and flame and all that just didn't, wasn't a good idea. So when soon as something better came along, they came out with other plastics that weren't so flammable, uh, the celluloid just died away. Very collectible now though, uh, the ones that survived, uh, some of the big Santa Claus, I bought a sleigh and a Santa, uh, and I haven't bought a lot of Christmas for quite some time because, but I couldn't help myself. I saw this sleigh in Sa uh, Santa Claus, a big celluloid one. So I did manage to get that. Uh, stuffed Santas. That's a whole other area. We, uh, and I we took them down and I couldn't take a picture because they're already down. But from the top of our steps, bottom of our steps, all the way to the top, was all, all the way on both sides was stuffed Santa Clauses, <coughs> different Santa Clauses. Uh, and uh, you know, there's squeakies, there's chalks, there's nodders. Uh, there's a lot of different stuffed Santa Clauses. Uh, Knickerbocker made some great <coughs> Christmas Santa Clauses. Uh, there's some that, uh, it's hard to describe the way some of them are. Uh, you wouldn't believe they're Santas, but they are. But stuffed Santa Clauses is another area that you could get into. The other thing, another thing would be porcelains. Uh, I brought a few here, uh, and I, what I did is I brought these Noel figures, and I'll just kind of pick them up here a little bit. Uh, but collecting Christmas porcelains from the 40s and 50s, uh, big area, Santa Clauses, and I didn't bring a porcelain Santa Claus. Here's another Noel, uh, Noel bunch of figures in their boxes yet. Uh, but the other thing with the Santa Claus and stuff, you, you, there's such a thing as called spaghetti, or it's called, you know, it's trim, but it's spaghetti. I call it spaghetti. Uh, so
So you want to look for Santa Clauses or angels or whatever with, with the spaghetti on them. Uh, the other area that, and I actually couldn't get to them, they're on a shelf with the Christmas trees in front, uh, but Mr. and Mrs. Santa Claus is in porcelain. Different, uh, different varieties and different ways that they were done, almost like the Noels. There's people that just collect Noels, there's people that just collect Mr. and Mrs. Santa Clauses, or just Santa Clauses, or Santa Clauses in some other uh, type of uh, uh, mode. Uh, you can find angels, elves, candle sitters, candle holders, and I brought some candle sitters here in this box. Here, I'm just going to go like this. Let's see, there are, there are candle sitters that sat right on the candles. And I had a set of angels out, but I didn't know place to put them in the box, so I put them back. Uh, so you're looking at flocked or spaghetti. Uh, Christmas China, another big field. Uh, Creams or, creamers and pitchers and plates and whole poly sets of china. Uh, most of the time it's a lot of holly, a lot of holly sets. Uh, but a whole other collecting field. I have a little bit of it at home. Didn't bring that along. Uh, another whole collecting field would just be Christmas china. Treetops, Christmas treetops. Well, you can almost put that in with ornaments. But at the same time, it's a little different because there's so many variations in tree tops. And the German people before the First World War made some beautiful, beautiful tree tops. Um, may not find them very easily; it might be a real struggle. But the stuff between the wars and you know just after the war, still some beautiful tree tops out there. And again, they're going up in price all the time. Uh, I brought cotton batting ornaments here. Uh, one of the few things I bought this year, cotton bat enormous. Most of the time there are fruits or vegetables. Uh, I do have in one of these other boxes here uh, some icicles. But their cotton batting is compressed cotton uh, that was compressed, uh, slacked down, and painted. And so uh, they're, they're not really breakable unless you really squeeze them and beat them up. But I mean, there's, they're, so you can see there's bells and there was. Uh, there's some carrots in there, uh, radishes, pears, um, different types of uh, cotton batting. Christmas jewelry, a uh, whole other other field. And this this one my wife likes, but uh, you can see this is just the just the Christmas trees. Uh, she has she has three flats like this of of Christmas jewelry, uh, and we pick it up here and there. And you can find this yet again. The maker kind of dictates the price. You know, so, uh, Eisenberg or uh, Tiffany, uh, Tafari, I mean, uh, is going to be more money than a piece that's not marked. But some of the unmarked stuff is still very nice. Uh, okay, Christmas jewelry, Christmas Santa toys. Uh, Santa toys, wind ups. You know, the Christmas toys of all different types uh, that. Generally, most of the time, we're a Santa Claus in a sleigh, or uh, in a car, or on an airplane, or you know, just about anything. But there's a, again a kind of an expensive field, but uh, that's another collecting field that a person uh, can get into. I do want to caution you about a couple things uh, before we. I don't know how I'm doing on time. Can you hear me? Okay, everybody here. Okay, okay. Uh, you do have to watch when you're collecting ornaments, and I'm going to get into ornaments a little bit here. Uh, you want to watch for quality. There's a lot of reproductions out there. Uh, the newer stuff, uh, even some of the stuff that's older that was made uh, between the wars, that was made for Woolworths and some of the dime stores is not the quality or the detail of painting that some of the other uh, what would you say, mom and top, mom and pop stores sold. Uh, the other thing, if you're collecting ornaments, you want to make sure that you don't have broken pikes. And you, the pikes kind of can tell you a little bit about what kind of ornament it is. Uh, generally, the longer the pike, the newer the ornament. Generally, uh, the thinner the pike, the older the ornament. Uh, and you have to watch for switched caps. 
Now I'm talking about the spring caps because I, I've got a good example here I'm going to give you. I didn't bring them along. Uh, again, it just didn't work out with the packing. But uh, a couple days ago, I bought two ornaments. And, and I bought them reasonable. Um, the nice lady, uh, she didn't try to misrepresent them at all. But one, they were two round ornaments, both Czechoslovakian. And one says Czechoslovakia on it. The other ornament is exactly identical. It's got a Japanese cap on it. So you do have to watch the caps and make sure the cap is what was for the ornament. Now sometimes that can be difficult because sometimes the caps aren't marked. Uh, some of the caps earlier on were a heavier metal. They were small uh, and they were lead. And so that kind of gives you an indication of somewhat of the age of the ornament. Uh, you want to walk for good colors if you're looking for ornaments and make sure that uh, you know the colors aren't all washed out especially uh, you know you can be a little more forgiving on the stuff that's you know before the first world war and maybe even you know after the first world war but if you get into the 50s and 60s stuff you want to make sure you have good quality good color uh, some of the west german stuff excellent color and some very nice ornaments just you know make sure they aren't all sun scorched and faded and that type of thing and of course you want I'm not even going to get into fixing ornaments. Uh, that's a whole other, that's a whole talk topic in itself. Uh, I did, I have tried to fix some ornaments. It's a real pain. So what I would say is if something is broke, don't buy it. Because it's, it's not an easy fix. Okay. Uh, have I missed anything? <laughs> uh, I wanted to talk about putz figures a little bit. Uh, and actually, I kind of found this out when they talk about a crash. When they talk about a crash, that's a Catholic nativity. That's formally, it's a Catholic type nativity. They talk about a putz. A putz is a Moravian village scene or a house scene. Uh, and so, collecting the putz figures is a very popular thing to do. And some people use the houses. But these houses wouldn't have been original with a real putt scene. They would have handmade the houses and things, and then they would have had the, you know, the sheep and the goats and things with the wooden legs and little trees and moss, and they put these together. We were in uh, Salzburg, and we went to uh, was in the Welcome Center in, in Salzburg, and they had a putt scene. It was was like your opening here. It was all glassed in. And it was absolutely breathtaking, all handmade, uh, very, very old. But, but those are real putt scenes. And but people do collect and set up putt scenes. Now, I moved some cabinets, and we had some scenes set up uh, with the, with these little people, with some of this type of thing here, you know, with uh, snowmen. And these are all again cotton batting, or most of them. But so that's another collecting field is uh, collecting the putts uh, items. Now another thing, uh, I guess I want to warn you too. You don't want to do it like I did <laughs> if you're going to collect Christmas. Focus on an area. You can't be knowledgeable about everything. So if you you know even if you pick out a couple areas to focus on and collect, you're going to be further ahead in the long run because you can't buy it all. Uh, nowadays, it's just too much money. And again, you run into a storage problem, a display problem. If you collect certain areas that you want to concentrate in, uh, you can become very knowledgeable about those areas. Make sure you collect what you like. Don't collect with the idea you're collecting, oh, I really don't like this, but I think I'm going to turn it over and make a dollar. That's not the right attitude to have. You want to collect what you like, and if you make a dollar, fine. If you don't, you have an item you like anyway. Uh, purchase the best you can afford. Uh, this is, you know, Christmas is, you know, the collectibles field and the antique field isn't so great right now. And, uh, but Christmas comes around every year. There's always interest in Christmas and holidays. Halloween, not so much Easter, but Easter, uh, Valentine's Day, they come around once a year, kind of renew everybody's memory and get everybody back in the, the swing of things. So Christmas is actually 
uh, a good collecting field if you're going to collect something and, and you want to do it as an investment type thing, but don't collect something you don't like. Uh, collect with the idea of preserving culture and history. Collect it because you want to do it. Because there's, there's, there's something to having this stuff more than just the money part of it. It's coming here and talking to you about it. It's having your friends over, your family, whatever, to see this stuff. This is the way it was. And again, uh, I'm sorry I couldn't bring more than what I did, but you can, when you look after a while here, you're gonna see that it shows the culture of years ago and what people did. And it's worth preserving. Uh, if we got time, I'm gonna go into ornaments a little bit. I don't know how far I'm gonna get. Uh, before the First World War, uh, and this is, uh, you know, 1600s, uh, late 1500s, uh, the Lutheran glass blowers uh, of Swabia, and Swabia, I'm actually Swabia and myself, <coughs> moved from Swabia and they moved into Thur the Thuringia region of Germany. And they were, before, because of religious reasons, and that's where they set up shop, uh, starting to blow glass. And they were black glass blowers, but they hadn't really got into Christmas yet. Uh, Thuringia in Germany is just north of Bavaria, and the city of Lausche, or that <coughs> area where Lausche is in, the southern, is in the southern part of Thuringia, so just north into Bavaria, or just north of Bavaria. Uh, the first uh, glass factory was started in 1597, uh, and there was also glass factory started later in Bohemia, which is Czechoslovakia, or it was, you know, Czech Republic now. Uh, and then they developed the silver nitrate lining, and that's what really set the glass ornament business on, was they found out how to, <coughs> it was very poisonous, but in the later on they changed and they had a safer recipe, but it gave the silver linings behind the ornaments. And I, well I guess these you can see, I'll just pick them up, you can see the silvering, it's a silver background into the ornament and they would put that in, spray it in, uh, mix, uh, you know, sh shake it or sometimes you steam, they use different ways to disperse the silver nitrate into the back side of the ornaments, but that gave them the backing. Now during the war, and if we get that far, we can talk about that, I'll mention it now, they couldn't use silver nitrate, so that's why all the ornaments are clear. Because, they, they, because of the war, they wouldn't let them use the silver nitrate, and, and the same with the, the caps and things like that. Now about this time, again, this would be uh, middle 1800s. Uh, you probably have heard the word kugel, kugelin. Uh, those are the big, heavy, ornaments that were around, they were real heavy glass, they had the silver nitrate behind them, then they were painted over, uh, there were round balls, there was different colors of them, they had a brass cap fit tight with a ring that went through it for hanging, you know, they were very <clears throat> heavy, uh, some were grapes, some were other shapes, uh, different colors, uh, there was, uh, the. let me see here, the rarest is red, uh, and shades in amethyst, cobalt, medium blue, green, gold, silver. So there was kind of in that order of commonness. Hard to find them now. And now I would suspect here in Watertown that you would have some cooling around here because of the German heritage. Uh, I would suspect there is some. I have a number of them. Again, they're packed away. I couldn't bring any. Uh, okay. U.S. production, they tried to getting into it uh, in New York and New Jersey about 1846, didn't fly. The German stuff was too good, it was too reasonable, didn't fly in this country. Uh, they changed the silvering recipe in 1870 to make it more safe because of the silver nitrate that was, uh, the silver, uh, yeah, silver nitrate that was in the old recipe. They changed that, made it safer again. That made it a lot easier for people to uh, blow Christmas ornaments. Uh, the Christmas tree uh, decorating started about the 16th century 
in the Alsace region of France, or well, it was Germany at that time, uh, which is in the western edge of Germany between France and Germany. Uh, and before that, uh, in Germany, they would hang uh, crowns from the ceiling. And there would be wood carved crowns and hanging from the ceiling, and they would decorate these crowns. Uh, and they would hang different uh, uh, decorations from them. But about 18, uh, uh, find my early 16th century, so that'd be uh, early 1500s, that they actually started decorating Christmas trees. Uh, one of the first things they came out with was Venetian dew. And Venetian do, I'll show you an ornament. This, well, maybe this is a better one to show. This is Venetian do on here, and it's crushed glass. And then it was glued onto the ornaments uh, to decorate them. And they started coming out with that uh, very early. It used a gelatin uh, adhesive to put on, to uh, glue it to the, to the uh, ornaments. They used other decorative materials, chenille, uh, white cotton, wool, glass, uh, silk thread, glass angel hair, tinsel, wire wrapping. They used a number of different things for the early ornaments. They would make, the, they would make a form uh, uh, out of wood or clay, and they would carve that. And what they're saying now is none of these forms have survived. There's none of them around. But they would take these forms in and then make plaster molds from these forms, and then they would blow the ornaments into these forms. Now this is a little more current, uh, and maybe a little more relevant. Uh, in 1890, F.W. Woolworth in, uh, imported 216,000 ornaments. Uh, he was the largest ornament importer at the time in this country and was strictly importing from Germany from the Lausche region generally uh, probably some from, uh, from Bohemia uh, so he was the largest importer at the time uh, Moravian uh, again there is Moravian here again that's Czech area uh, did a lot of the beading and glass bars tubes string ornaments uh, that you see that belong, you have a glass tube and then the rings and then the balls and they kind of put it together. Uh, those were generally Czechoslovakian, the later ones were Japanese and I think I have a couple of them here someplace. Uh, they did glass, uh, some of the most popular uh, was glass flute <coughs> ornaments, horns, musical instruments, uh, smoking pipes, uh, uh, popular personalities of the day, sailboats, and the Christ child. Uh, and then the war came, and it's real hard to find ornaments before the war. I mean, I mean you can find some kugel, uh, there's some of those of them, but a lot of the other ones are very difficult to find. Uh, so the war started uh, in 1914, and by 1916, all of the foreign stock in this country was gone. It had all been sold. Up. I mean, people just went bonkers over the German ornaments uh, that they were getting in. So in 1918, the U.S. made the first appeared crude imitations, or tried to make imitations of the German ornaments, big flop. Uh, what they tried to do is they tried to get U.S. workers to work in their homes like they did in Germany in the cottage industry. It didn't work, so then they went and built the factories and tried to uh, do them in factories and it just didn't take off. They weren't the quality that the U.S. public was used to. One of the things I found interesting though and that I didn't know when I was doing this research, uh, pikes and caps. The old German ornaments use a, what they call a spring cap but a real small wire spring and a real small cap. And as such a lot of the ornaments, the springs got weak, they fell, they broke. Uh, there was problems with the caps. Now the U.S. Uh, decided they were going to do a difference, so they made bigger, stronger caps, longer springs uh, to hold the ornaments. One of the things they did that was better than the German part of it. Uh, but the U.S. missed the unique, uh, creative German ornaments uh, that the Germans were putting out. Now the U.S. started importing again in 1920. Uh, in the ornament business, the United States dropped again. We were out of it. 
Um, the Czechs entered the business again in 1925 with their beaded glass uh, ornaments with the balls, beads, and uh, bars, and that type of thing. Uh, the golden age of tree decorating was the 1920s. Uh, and there were so many ornaments being imported into this country that the people in Thuringia, which is Laosia and that general area there, were working six days a week, 10 to 12 hours a day, trying to meet demand for the ornaments that were being imported into this country. Uh, again, uh, I must, I have to say the five and 10 cent stores, Woolworth imported the low end stuff and they were cheap. Uh, people bought them, you're gonna find a lot of that stuff, so you wanna be aware of quality of ornaments. There is, there can be a difference in them. Uh, one thing I didn't mention, I didn't mention feather trees. Uh, in the pictures we have, you'll see there's two feather trees up. Uh, when they come out of the feathers trees, which is actually goose feathers wrapped uh, with wire and, and tape on a, on a frame, and then usually put into a wood base. Uh, they had to come out with small ornaments. Now you hear a lot of people saying they got feather tree ornaments. Most of the time they're not. Uh, the feather tree ornaments are three quarter inch to one inch in diameter. They're very small to be in scale with the feather trees, which generally, I mean, you had some that were five, six feet, but most of them were three feet, four feet maybe. Those were the normal ones, even two feet. Uh, so they, they did come out with feather trees and feather tree ornaments about this time. Uh, uh, some of the feather trees uh, actually came with one inch candles built right into the feathers, right into the tree itself with the, with the candles built on. Uh, Japan entered the market in 1925 uh, with ornaments very inferior at that time. Uh, and again, there was problems in Europe. So we were still importing imp or ornaments yet, uh, but there was problems starting. And so people were starting to see, you know, this, this may not last, we better do something. So Paragon Glass in New Jersey started in about 1930s and started machine making uh, ornaments. Uh, wasn't real popular. Uh, Max Eckert, uh, which actually started Shiny Bright, uh, he was from the Laosha area, his family was. Uh, he immigrated to the country uh, before the war, shortly before the war he came to this country. And then he was the biggest importer of ornaments uh, in the United States, uh, well, during the, well, during the war and after the war. Uh, during the war it was usually, mostly it was US made items. And again, the unsilvered, uh, a lot of it was unsilvered. Some of it had paper caps, which we call paper caps, and I didn't bring any. Uh, but those ornaments uh, were the war, what they call the war ornaments. One thing about Christmas ornaments, you can kind of date them by pre-World War I, which is difficult. Then you can date, you know, during the war, there was no, nothing imported into this country from Germany. Then you have the period from about 1920 until about 1938, uh, 40, somewhere in there that the import stopped again, so you can kind of date by mm -hmm. historical, chronological happenings in the world, the wars, and, and then you have, after the war, you have, uh, uh, the, you know, the f late 40s and 50s stuff, you have the Japan, you occupy Japan items that a lot of times are marked, so you can kind of date things by looking at history because of the, because of the wars. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, okay, in 1939, Woolworth received 235,000 US made machine ornaments. So we were getting into the business of making machine ornaments then because of the war or looking like war in Europe. Uh, from the beginning uh, until 1942, when Germany was, Lausche was completely out of the ornament business in 1942. Uh, there was 10,000 different European figural ornaments made. So there's a lot of stuff that was made. I mean, can you imagine 10,000? They just made everything. And, and a lot of it was very good. These people sat at their homes and this is what they did. That's how they made their living, blowing these ornaments. And then, you know, exporting them. Uh, some of the most popular ornaments were fruits and vegetables. And I'm going to just kind of name here 
uh, from the rarest to the most common. Peas in a pod, cucumber, onion, potato, beet, rutabaga, turnip, pumpkin, carrots, tomatoes, ears of corn, radish, mushrooms. Now, in Germany, some fruits are looked and vegetables are looked on higher than others. Well, the ones that they didn't like very well, they didn't make as many ornaments of. As they didn't think they were worth making an ornament. One of them was cucumbers. They, you know, cucumber well, evidently isn't very well thought of, so they didn't make many cucumbers. But so to find a cucumber now you know, is, is a more rare ornament than, let's say, tomatoes or something like that. Uh, potatoes. Uh, I've got a couple potatoes. Uh, but that kind of gives you an idea of uh, what was popular. Now, birds were the most common ornaments made. Uh, and they were attached either by uh, glass hooks, which, uh, which we call a nail hook, which is built right into the ornaments. It's just a glass hook. Uh, a spring clip, uh, which I can show you later here if somebody wants to look. It's, it's actually a, a cone-shaped clip spring with a clip on the end that they, they clip the ornament to the tree or else the spring clip which is a normal which you see uh, with the cap I should say spring clip spring cap uh, that you see with the cap and the wire spring that goes down into it uh, then there was the wire wraps uh, that actually had wire wrapped around the ornaments and could uh, hang on the tree that way uh, a lot of the earliest birds you can kind of tell a little bit the way this the clip opens up. If it opens up towards the beak, towards the front of the ornament, is older than if it opens up towards the back. Uh, spring caps were primarily used on owls and parrots. And I've got an owl here in one of the boxes here with a, with a spring cap on it. Uh, songbirds were the most common. Uh, and they had feathers or tinsel, spun glass tails. Most of the time you see them with spun glass tails. Uh, then uh, the Santas, uh, or Father Christmas, Belsnickel, Kris Kringle, uh, they were the ornament that was the most in demand all the time. And so when, like during the Depression, things got a little tough, if they could buy one ornament, they'd buy a Santa Claus. So you see Santa Claus is more. Now what I want to tell you is there's actually three types. You have the full suit Santa Claus, which is, you know, the full figure. Those are the most rare. Those are the hardest ones to find. Then you have the half Santas, which are from the bottom of the coat up. And those are, uh, those you find more often. Uh, then you have uh, just heads of Santa Claus. And I've got a one just a, a head that I had out that I brought along. Uh, the other thing with the Santa Clauses, if you're going to go into Santa Clauses, you want to look for different colors of coats. There's green ones, blue ones, um, other than just the plain old red one. Uh, there's actually white and brown also. Now the Santa Claus that we think of is the big jolly plump Santa Claus smoking a pipe. Well that's Thomas Nast. Uh, and he was a carniturist, political carniturist uh, during the Civil War. Uh, did a lot of work after the Civil War for different magazines and his first publication in uh, Harper's Weekly was in 1863 of the Santa Claus that we think of. In Europe they think more of Father Christmas, they think of uh, uh, Kris Kringle, the, the, the smaller Santa, the narrow face, the beard, uh, more stern looking uh, than what Th Thomas Nass Santa Claus was. Uh, this is the Thomas Nass Santa Claus, right here. That's you know what you, what you think of and what you normally see now is the Thomas Nass type Santa Claus. Uh, again, some of the Santa Clauses were on spring clips, and I have some of them, but I don't have them along. Uh, but they were again on the spring clips, and that's the, the the clip with the cone spring, and then the clip on the end. Uh, the spring caps, uh, the spring caps were a later ornament for the Santas, so the spring caps generally are later. Uh, the German red, uh, and this is an occasion. I said, you know, don't buy faded Christmas, but the German red is never quite a true red. It's more of a subdued red. 
uh, especially the older ones. Red evidently is a real hard color for them to come up with a true red uh, in the painting. Uh, Okay, another uh, clue in collecting ornaments, the newer ornaments have a round spring. The older ones have a flat one. And you'll see on some of these ornaments here, they have a flat wire spring, not a round one. Uh, so that kind of gives you an indication too. Sometimes it's hard to date ornaments unless it's you know a shiny bright and an old figural. But if they're figural ornaments because after the war, they went back using the same forms. They went back using the same molds. So some of the very same ornaments were made later. Uh, so sometimes it can be a little touchy. So then what you gotta look at is glossiness, what the colors are, what the cap is. Uh, if it looks, you know, too new, it probably is a newer one. You know, if you're looking at a, you know, a 1914 or before ornament, it's gonna look like it's 1914 or before, generally. Uh, okay, I wanted to get into lighting a little bit. Uh, how do we look there? Do we want to start lighting? Uh, Melissa? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, lighting was a whole different ball game. I mean, they started using lighting very early, even before the ornaments, they were lighting Christmas trees or trying to. Uh, and what they would do is they'd take a candle and heat a pin and push it into the bottom of the candle and try to wrap it around the branches. Burn lots of houses down. Uh, stick pins, uh, like I said, stick pins were pushed in. they try to stick them through the branches and into the candle. Then they came out uh, in about 1867 into the 1900s uh, with tin candle holders with clips. And you've probably seen them there around. Uh, and they came in a number of different ways. Uh, there was fish and there was flowers and there was Santas and angels, uh, cones. Some of them had lithos added to them. Uh, Steers, Sears still sold them into the 1950s. Uh, some of the spring clips for candles actually, and I've got a few of them, uh, were jointed or they had, were on a ball so you could, you know, you'd stick the candle clip onto the branch and it was like this where you could bring it around and bring your candle straight because it, the actual candle clip uh, where the candle went in moved. Uh, then the candles uh, generally four to six inches. Um, Standard Oil made a lot of them. Uh, and they were made of paraffin wax. I've got a number of boxes of them at home. And you're gonna need the candles for your angel chimes here. Uh, a lot of them were heavily embossed, like I said. Uh, then uh, <coughs> they came out with the counterbalance uh, candle holders. And these are, I think I only have a couple of them, very hard to find. And so I can't actually bring one to show, but they were uh, a clip that held a candle and it had a loop wire that came around and it came like this with a weight on the end. And the weights, would hold a candle up straight. It just kind of hung there and perched on the, on the, but very, some of them were very, very ornate. Uh, so they had a pendulum on the bottom with colored balls. Some were glass, some were whistles, glass pine cones, glass lanterns, uh, soft. Uh, some of them were soft lead. Uh, there was tin weights. There was forms of angels, cones, icicles, and stars. There were Santas, but these were all different types of pendulums that they had on these Christmas ornaments. Now I'm just going to, I've got a couple here, uh, and this is actually a quite a rare one because it's a double. They put ornaments on the bottoms of some of them also. See there you see the spring clip, and then it held the candle up here, and then she clipped on. So this isn't actually a wire one, but it was, this is what they would do on some of the uh, spring, on the uh, counterbalance uh, candle holders. Similar to that. Uh, then they came out with the lanterns. Uh, and I was going to bring a lantern. I couldn't get it in one of the boxes. 
Uh, but the lanterns, and you've seen them, they were glass, almost look a vol like a Volta candle holder. They were different colors and different materials. Uh, when they first started out, uh, some of them were metal, and then they would put the candle inside this and hang it on the tree or clip it to the tree, and they would collapse. The ones that I have and the ones I've seen are glass, and they look almost like a, like a little jar and it had a wire bale on them and they put a candle in them and then hang it on the tree. Uh, you do see them now and then, not, not real often. Uh, okay, then we need to talk about uh, Edison. Uh, in 1882, uh, the first electric Christmas tree was lit in this country. Uh, and it was a small string, 80 small electric uh, light string. Uh, they went commercial in 1882, or 1892. First light string actually lit a Christmas tree in 1882. Uh, the, stra the, the strings at, at that time, uh, generally they were strings of eight uh, because of the voltage that they had. That's what they could have. And, but they would have what they called a festoon of eight. And, what they would do, they would have a wire contraption, a box, on top of the tree. And at that time, you screwed the plug-in. It wasn't a plug-in like we normally have today. You screwed it in like a light bulb socket, like a light bulb. And you'd screw that in, and it swiveled, and they would screw that in. And then this box would sit on top of the tree, and then they'd put these screw in the festoons of eight lights to these, this box up there. It must have been quite a job to get that all set up. Uh, later, the light strings were plastic, but they did start out as cloth covered. Uh, generally, uh, you had four festoons to a junction box, which was, again, sitting on top of the tree. Uh, the two-blade plug started in 1923, uh, and it was sold with a screw adapter because a lot of people, especially on the country, had just the, didn't have the, the new plug-in style uh, when the new two-prong plug-ins came out. Uh, then they came out with uh, lamps, which would be called a C6. And, uh, well, some of the bulbs I have, if you want to look, uh, are C6 bulbs. That's the small bulb, and no normally these were wired in series. And if one went out, they all went out. You've heard that story. You've probably dealt with it. Uh, can be very aggravating. Uh, but anyway, they came out with these bulbs and some were painted, some were frosted. Uh, and those were actually where its whole thing really started out. Okay. Uh, 1916, G uh, licensed <coughs> Mazda uh, to produce a bulb line and they came out with the tungsten filaments, which were much superior to the more standard filament that GE was using. Uh, didn't, it didn't take the power, it took the power better and was brighter. Otherwise, and I forget what the other, this carbon was a carbon filament, was more resistant to the electrical current and wouldn't burn bright, and so, or, or as bright. So anyway, Mazda came out with their figure of lights about 1919. Uh, Then uh, the Japanese came out, 1918, came out with a milk glass of uh, figural ornaments, or figural lights, and there's a number of them here in one of the boxes that we can, uh, they came out with this type of, uh, you know, like this is a Santa head here, milk glass. The Japanese all did milk glass, uh, opposite of the Europeans, which didn't do milk glass, but actually did the painting or the, Normally didn't have silvering in them, uh, but they would do the painting on the outside. And I've got examples of both here. Uh, uh, then one of the real popular lights uh, was the Noma uh, Mickey Mouse lights. And if you may, you may have seen them, I've seen them different times. <laughs> sell for big dollars, but they were a uh, uh, shade that was introduced in the New York World's Fair and it was the Mickey Mouse figures, and it was a plastic shade that clamped onto a light. Were very popular at the time. Uh, they were C6. Uh, 
Uh, and they had decals of Mickey and all of his buddies uh, on these uh, plastic shades. And then in 1927, the Wonder Stars came out. Match, <laughs> these were the matchless stars. And uh, here's one right here. This is a bigger one. These were matchless stars. Now, Can you hold it up higher? Yeah, that's a matchless star. Uh, the glass ones. Uh, were actually cut glass from Czechoslovakia that they put together to make these stars. So that's one there. But they came out in, what did I say, 1927? Yeah, 1927. Some of them had one roll of lights and, or one roll of cut glass and some had two rolls of cut glass. The two rolls are uh, very difficult to come on to. Uh, then Paramounts, you come out with the bubble lights. Uh, Again, uh, very were very popular after the war. Norma, Norma uh, was a big pusher of the bubble lights. And the story goes that uh, the fellow that developed the material in the, in the tube uh, took it to all these light bulb company or, or Christmas tree light companies. Nobody was interested. Mm -hmm. He went to this Norma, which was a cooperative of a number of small Christmas tree decoration manufacturers that came together and formed this organization. They took it on, uh, made a bundle. Nobody else wanted. Then it went to court, and the other people sued to be able to use that, to use that uh, patent, and they won. Uh, the guy that uh, developed it ended up getting little. He got. He was getting so much royalty for every bulb that was produced, and then after it went to court, he got nothing. So he, he, they wanted to give him something and he didn't want to take it, so then he didn't get anything what boiled down to. Uh, his name was uh, Carl Otis. He invented them about 1940. And there's lots of different styles of bubble lights. Uh, there's what we call rockets, biscuits, and satellites. And uh, I don't think I brought any. <laughs> I guess I did bring them. But anyway, uh, some of them, most of them have just kind of a water solution in them. It's a low boiling point water solution that uh, starts the, the bubbling. The, the heat from the bulb uh, heats the water up in it and bubbles. But some of them have oil in them. And those are the ones that I love to try to find. I found one last year. Uh, and this has uh, two, two, two oils in it. And or one oil in it, and it makes real small bubbles, a lot of them, uh, but it's, it's an oil type solution. Then there is the shooting stars, which is, has a two different types density of fluid in the tubes, and so it makes this kind of shooting uh, into the, in, uh, shooting like star-like figure uh, thing into the tubes. Uh, again, very, very hard to find the shooting stars, they're very expensive. Uh, by the 1960s, uh, popularity decreased in bubble lights. Uh, there was a couple companies that tried coming out with them again, got off a little bit. I think if you look around, you can still probably find them. Uh, not quite as nice as the old ones, though. Uh, again, if you're going to buy bubble lights, check them out and make sure they work. <laughs> uh, sometimes you can get them to work. There's a plug in the bottom of the tube, and sometimes you give it a little shake like that you can get it loose and, and uh, it, that plug has to come loose so it can heat up but uh, so sometimes you can get them to work if they're not working but generally you want to make sure you check them out so that's all I wrote down <laughs> uh, I hope you look through the books there and you'll get some ideas in the one book I highlighted uh, I don't know where that book is, but I highlighted some of the things I talked about and some of the things I didn't. Uh, like I said, it's a big, big field, it and sure is. Is. when you try to talk about Christmas, I almost should break it down into you know lights, and yeah. uh, you could spend a whole afternoon on just yeah. you know one little area to, to do it all. So I'm trying to give you an overview with the idea that there's more to, more to it than just ornaments. And ornaments is a big thing, and always will be. But there's a lot of other areas that you can get into with Christmas that's very satisfying. Doesn't take a lot of room. Uh, one thing with ornaments, you gotta always be careful. <laughs> a, a story, and I'm ashamed to actually say this. I bought a bunch of ornaments of, of, at an auction not too long ago. Well, I was looking at this one ornament and it's 
looks like a like an apple or something. Well, I thought I had bought a bunch of this cotton batting fruit. Remember this year? Bought a bunch of cotton batting fruit. And I thought it was a cotton batting one. So I'm checking it. I I'm pushing on it. Smash. <laughs> so. Yeah, you're always care you always have to be careful. You don't want to drop the box. <laughs> if you're, you know, if you're collecting paper, uh, you just got to worry about fire because you know, and you keep stuff in a nice dry place. With most of these collectible items, you want to make sure you keep it kind of dark, not real hot, not real cold. Uh, sometimes that can be hard to do, but that's what you shoot for. So with that, I guess mm -hmm. we can go on. Any Brad? questions? Yeah. Clothing. I can see your tie. Oh, yeah. That's oh. another field you can collect. No, I tell you, I'm sorry on this tie. It's been in my closet for a long time, and I've never had an occasion to wear it. And I thought if I can't wear it tonight, I'll never be able to wear it. So I'm going to go for it. So a lot yep, of collectibles in clothing. Yes, a lot of collectibles in clothing, I'll bet you. Yep. That's not one I thought of, but you're right. Yep. What did you mean you mentioned the word spaghetti? Oh, spaghetti. Uh, OK. Uh, so it's like emboss, not embossing. Spaghetti is like the rough uh, flossing, uh, almost looks like flocking. Flocking is the word I'm looking for. Spaghetti, and it's not only in Christmas things. It's they did, a, you know, in, in in the 50s especially, in the porcelain items, did a lot of flocking spaghetti. The poodles, the 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 the, the, uh, flo the spaghetti poodles is a good example of other things they. I uh, did uh, the, the spaghetti on the porcelain. Yeah. Um, I had these boots, but I don't know what was on the front of them, and so I put the points up on there. It could have been just like that. Oh. See, they had a cloth. They had a cloth sack in them. There was a cloth. Oh, there was a cloth piece that fit in here, and then they'd fill it with candy and and whatever. It was like almost like a Christmas stocking, and they would. Yep. Them are good size ones. A lot of them are smaller. It was my husband's uh, Christmas. Yeah. Stuff. Probably about 1930s. Um, 20s. Yeah, could be. 24. Interesting. Yeah. So what are yeah. they made out of? It's, it's paper mache. I want to start something out. I didn't yeah. think about that yeah. stock. Yeah. Like that. You mentioned a tree house before. Yep. Would that be like a star or an angel that was on top of the tree? Right, yeah, that would be. Could you describe like an ultimate tree? Oh, <laughs> an ultimate treetop, I guess, would be you know a, a porcelain, you know, a blown glass, pre World War One. Uh, the treetop that you think a lot of that people collect are the angels with uh, with a spun glass. I've got a number of them in the boxes yet, uh, but there's a lot of different stuff. A lot of nice West German treetops now that were produced after the war. Uh, a lot of you know the lights and the figural stuff. Uh, for treetops. How about for people who have brought items? I know, Ruthie, you brought your item. Would you be willing to stand up and share it with the group and talk about it? Uh, date on the back says 1951, so I don't know if that's, um, that's what you bought it or. Uh, sure. And I was wondering about carolers, you know, like a collection of okay. um, porcelain carolers. <coughs> Did you have anything on that? Uh, again, a lot of that porcelain carolers and stuff was 50s. In the 1950s, there's, there's porcelain carolers that are individuals, then there's porcelain carolers that are groups like you've got there. Yeah. Yep, a lot of uh, candles that were, you know, carolers and candles, and you probably have seen them. Yep. And they were, people, you know, bought them at the dime store, they were probably 29 cents. You know. <laughs> You know, I, when I was growing up in high school, I worked at a dime store, McLellan's Dime Store. Most fabulous place in the world to work at Christmas time. The stuff I wish I could just have $100 and go in there right now. <laughs> yeah. So how about um, other people who have brought items who would like to share with the group? We can start back here. <laughs> it's a gravy boat, and he mentioned the holly pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How about your items? Well, we had an aunt who was 99 when she passed away, and we got a few of her Christmas items, and we're not real intelligent about when they were actually made. 
But this is a real tinsel type of ornament. It's paper. Uh, don't know exactly if it's from the 30s yeah, or 20s. Like or that, probably. Yeah. And right. then we have a, I guess it's like a tin or metal ornament, a little basket of flowers. And this one's not in real good shape, but it's a very old with a little oh, Santa Claus on almost. the front. And a sailboat. And it's a sailboat. Yeah. Yeah, that's nice. And then we have some real old garland yeah. oh, that has oh, tinsel wow. on the top of it. That's interesting. Yeah. And there are glass balls and glass on the inside. And then I was told that this little guy is a composite wood Christmas ornament. Could be. I can't see. Uh, so I guess he's extremely rare. And again, I don't know from what decade he's from. Almost looks wax. <laughs> well, that's wood. They used to make wax ones also. And then one of the interesting things that we found when my husband and I collected Christmas stuff were these tin ornaments. And we were told that they were around the war when they ran out of materials. Uh, and we've never seen them again, but we have numerous different ones. And they're all kind of like patriotic little colors, it seems. Uh, and it's got a star on it. So we've never seen them again. And they're, they're ten. They're ten. Mm -hmm. And they're definitely not reproductions. And then this is another type of, I mean, you're the expert. <laughs> We're not, you know, it's got tinsel on the top of it all around. And our favorite thing that we collected through the years were these, you have to either like them or hate them, aluminum trees. <laughs> and we had numerous pink ones and gold ones and the, one of the most unusual aluminum trees was a peacock tree and it was only about that wide and it was designed or they made them for small like apartments where you didn't have a lot of room and it went flush up against the wall and it's called a peacock aluminum tree and so they were, we had gold ones. They were really unusual. And another uh, aluminum tree that was just beautiful, the needles on one side were green and the other side were blue. Mm -hmm. And our favorite tree was Aluminum Specialty Company. And they were from Manitowoc, Wisconsin. And of course they turned out to be Miro aluminum through the years but they were quite a very very nice aluminum tree but we uh, had numerous ones of, through our collecting so on oh, and Bob like bubble lights and <laughs> you know like you just go on and on we no, just you got bubble trees you got bubble lamp trees eh? we had bubble light uh, trees. trees yep so <laughs> How many other lots questions? of fun auction and they had an aluminum tree my sister-in-law said, oh, throw that old thing away. And my mother-in-law said, no, put it on the sale. Mm -hmm. And they bid and bid, and it brought $125. <laughs> <laughs> and we were out at the Jefferson Racetrack Flea Market probably 25, 30 years ago. And I was just looking around and just looking down on the ground. And the guy says, if you haul it away, you can have it for a buck. <laughs> so I thought, well, when I grew up, we were never rich enough to have an aluminum tree. But Bob had an aluminum tree, so I thought, well, you know, he might like to see an aluminum tree again. It turned out it was a taper tree, and it had a pom-pom end and a blue turquoise insert at the end of the pom-pom. And it was just a beautiful tree. <laughs> and I got for a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're, they're, they're still popular. A lot of people. Yeah, there's a them. demand for them. Yep. Uh, again. <laughs> I didn't get into aluminum trees. 
but uh, for another time. Yeah. What's that? Snow globes. Oh. Snow globes? Yeah. Snow globes? Yeah. Okay, snow globes. Yeah. Tell me what you're talking about a little more. Oh! Snow globes. <laughs> you know, I guess I... I just, <laughs> there's lights that were called glow lights and the different lights too. Yeah, the snow globes, uh, some of the early ones have, are very nice. And you can know you can put water back in them. The ones that are earlier had a little plug in and you can take the plug out and take a, take a syringe and put water back in them. Because I've done it a number of times. There's a little plug right in the bottom that you can get out. But there's a lot of different ones. What's that? water and then fake snow, you know, the, the mica type of snow, you know, Santa Claus's villages, Santa Claus's on sleighs, I mean, there's a whole, and there's bigger ones also, and then there's the newer ones, uh, you know, that are actually, the ones I you normally see are short, the ones, you know, from the 50s, uh, short, but, you know, now they have the big ones with the real fancy, uh, some of them are musical now, yeah. That's a whole other field. Yeah, didn't have that down. So Go ahead. It's just water. It's just water. Generally year, water, yeah. About what year would a musical tree stand? Um, oh, okay. Rotating. Yes, yes. After the war, early 50s. Yeah. See, like, again, this is a good way, a good, an item that you can date a little bit because of the war. Because, you know, before the war, you know, in the 30s, you wouldn't have done that. During the war, they didn't have the metal to do it. So you're, you know, late 40s into the 50s, mid 50s. I've had a couple of those uh, musical tree stands. Yeah. I got a question now related to the that great school kids would have made. Mm -hmm. I was Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I actually had that down, the, the, the homemade or the craft type uh, Christmas arms. Again, that's another field. And I, you know, we have all these Christmas trees up, but I haven't had a live tree up for a number of years <laughs> because, because we leave them up too long and they get too dry. And, but this year we're going to put up a live one and I'm going to put on the ornaments. The best ornaments I have are the ones my kids made. Yeah. And then we'll put them up. Else? I have one item I'll share. Oh. I love vintage Christmas, thus the reason for this presentation tonight. Um, this was actually a, a new acquisition. It's an old vintage jingle abra, the candle chimes. Mm -hmm. This one is uh, post World War II, so it probably was made uh, pre 1950. Uh, this one is Swedish. Uh, the ones before World War II mostly were German, and they were very elaborate, and many of them had a lithograph lithograph scene of the nativity on them, or um, the Kris Kringle, the Bell's Nickel. But uh, this one I love. I, I got it for a, a, a very reasonable price. Um, but it turns around, and when the candles are lit, it causes the propeller to turn, and then the little strikers hit the bells. And this has a little Merry Christmas lithograph on top, and then one here, and it also has a set that say Happy Birthday. And then it also, instead of the reindeer, I could put angels on. So I thought this was was unique, and what my favorite thing about it, though, is is the mint condition oh. box. So it's all about the box for me. It's all about the <laughs> box is in great shape, and then of course you have to have the candle chime accessories and the beautiful box as well. So I'm very pleased with this. Are there any other questions for Fred? Yes. I have a wooden one like that, but it's all fallen apart. Oh yeah. And it had the wooden propeller. Yep. The pyramid. Yep. And um, it's been in a box for years, and I'm thinking about getting rid of it. And then I think, well, maybe somebody would repair it. And well, you know, there's more interest in them all the time, the older ones. And I can't think of the name of what they're called now. Uh, I should have actually mentioned them. But they, some of them are very ornate, you know, and big. Some, you know, some of them. Are, some of them are huge. Uh, yeah, so it might be worth putting back together. Yeah, yeah. 
they, that I forget. There's a there's a name for them. I can't think of what it is. Uh, the ones that you see most of the time are newer. I shouldn't say when I say newer, I mean 50s, 60s. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure there was older ones also. Yeah, right. And again, it's the same principle as the angel chimes. The heat of the candles comes up and makes the propeller go and, and make the sound. Yep, yep. Well, everyone is invited to come up and take a look at the Christmas items here. Remember, look with your eyes, not your hands. Um, any questions, too, as you're looking around, please feel free to ask. So thank you, Fred. Thank you.